Good morning, good morning. I hope everyone um, got enough coffee to fuel you throughout this morning. Uh, I'm Margaret Lowe, I am president of Atlantic Live and we bring the Atlantic's journalism to life on stages across the country and it is so wonderful to be here in San Francisco and to see all of you here for a conversation about building opportunity for all. This is actually the third stop in a series on a topic that is now a rallying cry on the presidential campaign trail, the need to make the economy work better or in fact work at all um, for more Americans. And we've been to Philadelphia and we've been to Memphis exploring the widening gap between rich and poor and talking about how those cities can expand jobs and opportunity for more people. Here in San Francisco, we're gonna zoom in on the impact of tech, uh, an industry that has uh, spurred unprecedented innovation and wealth, and has also led to a stunning rise in income disparity. The same industry that transformed how we connect with one another, move from place to place in our cities, even fall in love, has also transformed the region's economy, and in its mighty wake, managed to create an alarming housing crisis. In this city, with breathtaking wealth, there are an estimated 8,000 homeless people. And every night, some 1,400 people are waiting for temporary shelter. So today, we're gonna to talk to people in the tech industry, policymakers, and city leaders about finding solutions. And of course, not everybody in this room is gonna agree on the best approach, but the goal here today is to confront the big issues, to spur new connections and to awaken big ideas. We actually have an exceptional lineup of speakers and a great audience too. In, the, uh, in, the, in this room, there are policy experts, students, leaders in business, tech, and nonprofits, and we would love all of you to be part of the conversation in the room too, and we're gonna um, take time for your questions throughout the morning. And we'd also like you to join the conversation on Twitter too. We're at Atlantic Live using the hashtag Atlantic Opportunity. Before we begin, I wanna thank our partners and our collaborators at the Shared Prosperity Partnership. It's an initiative, an initiative of the Kresge Foundation, the Brookings Institution, Living Cities, and the Urban Institute. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce the president of the Urban, Urban Institute, Sarah Rosenmortel. Uh, she's gonna go a little deeper on what the Shared Prosperity Project is and our purpose here today. With that, Sarah. Wow, this is a great room. I'm so pleased to be with you all today. Um, so it is my honor to welcome you on behalf of the partners of the Shared Prosperity Partnership and say hello also to those of you who are drive, uh, joining us online and to encourage all of you, I hope we'll mostly set aside our emails, but join the conversation today using the hashtag Atlantic Opportunity and you'll note uh, that the agenda has the Twitter handles of all of our participants, so if you want to uh, affirm or critique or engage with uh, the dialogue happening up on stage, you can do it in real time. Uh, it's also my duty to do some important thank yous, first of all to the Commonwealth Club for this fabulous facility for hosting us, and secondly to the Atlantic team for putting on this terrific uh, event today with us, and finally to our SP2 partners who worked with the Atlantic to put together today's program. The summit is part of a larger uh, project uh, that um, Margaret mentioned, the Shared Prosperity Partnership, which is a really unusual collaboration. Uh, SP2 is unusual because it's testing the proposition that these national organizations, who often work separately on, in many cases, overlapping issues, can actually do something together that adds up to more than the sum of the parts. And that was the vision of our fearless leader, Rip Rapson from Kresge. And it was not always smooth and easy, but I think his proposition has been proven to be the case. Um, the work that we do uh, in, involves both Rip uh, from Kre and a great team at Kresge, uh, our dear friend Amy Liu, who leads the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, uh, our friends at Living Cities, and we have with us today are also our partner from Aspen, Jennifer Bradley. So a lot of DC is come here, uh, but we're not here to do what Washington usually does, uh, which is uh, come offer answers, but instead to come and learn. And that's actually the kind of what's in the DNA of the SP2, as we call it, uh, the partnership. 
Um, what we've been doing is arriving in communities that we work together to select. Uh, and they're places that are wrestling with this challenge of how do we grow in a way that is more inclusive, that benefits all rather than have growth actually be a driver of division. And when we get there, the first thing we do is we listen. We try to find leaders from across a variety of different sectors, and we ask them, what are the questions that are really hard and difficult and critical to this place making progress on shared prosperity? And then we ask them, what could we do to help you do your work? Uh, and we determine amongst our organizations, we, where are the expertise and the assets and the analytic power to fuel your solutions, your ideas, and growth? And we try to support them in their journey. We bring to these efforts not only our own institutions, but experts we know from around the country. And what we have learned in all of our work in urban areas on how places are making progress. What are the examples of practices that seem to be working and things to avoid? We've been doing this work in a number of places. I'll just give a couple examples. We are working in Fresno uh, with the Central Valley Community uh, Foundation and many other partners who want to align their workforce development and economic development efforts and really make Fresno the center of a driving, thriving economic engine for the state. We're working in Arlington, Virginia, where the arrival of HQ2 from Amazon is fueling great fear of uh, displacement for many of the longstanding residents of those neighborhoods trying to see how we can help them be integrated in the economic engine that is being brought to that community. We've been doing work in Memphis where we're, the community is seeking to make racial equity integrally uh, involved in the allocation of community development capital and the investment in the future of that city and in a half a dozen more places so far. Each of these work streams has a strong aspect of community and resident co-creation, and each has a central focus on racial equity. And the third component of the SP2 work is to learn from all of these experiences what a mindful practice of advancing shared prosperity looks like, and how to use those insights to prompt new conversations in other cities and the conversations like we're going to have here today. Today's discussion is going to focus on a set of themes that has come up in one way or other in each of the different locations where we're working. To what extent is rapid technological change hardening inequality? And to what extent can it be harnessed to instead provide solutions that accelerate inclusion? We are honestly seeing some of both. And we must face the fact that the consequences of our newfound reliance on algorithms and predictive analytics are that they build on data that reflects centuries of discrimination. When ill-designed tools using that information decide who gets credit, who gets the job, who gets bail, and who doesn't, they hide the bias in something that's seemingly neutral and bake in uh, uh, our, our least sal uh, valuable parts of our nation's history. On the other hand, some of these same tools thoughtfully used can help us to find those who have capacity, but not perhaps the credential. They can be used to invite participation and give voice to those who have not had a seat at the table heretofore. And we are far more likely to use these tools for inclusion if we are inclusive in their design, bringing new voices to the creation process, creating with and not for. So we've gathered here today to learn together from those who are trying to do this right and see what we can take away from their experiences to share with others who are seeking to harness technology to, for inclusion. We're going to begin with a bird's eye view of how tech is changing nearly everything. And then we're going to work further into a set of conversations around solutions.